In 1939, author Nathaniel West described the people drawn to Hollywood. All their lives they had slaved at some kind of dull, heavy labor behind desks and counters, saving their pennies and dreaming of the leisure that would be theirs when they had enough. Where else should they go but California, the land of sunshine and oranges? Sunset Boulevard winds its way for 24 miles from downtown Los Angeles to the Pacific Ocean. The Sunset Strip comprises less than two miles of the thoroughfare from Doheny Drive to Crescent Heights Boulevard. The Sunset Strip is, is it's fantasy. It's old Hollywood and new Hollywood you know, the space-time continuum just meeting every night at this particular place. You know, there's, there's rich history here, tons of it, and, uh, and also there's always this new influx of people, uh, all of them wanting to sort of get in touch with this energy that's here. Well, I think like a lot of them associated with that like long hair rocker heyday thing, you know? And I try to tell them that it's, that there's a lot more to it than that, that you know, there was, you know, Mickey Cohen and Jack Dragner shooting it out and, you know, Ava Gardner slapping Frank Sinatra in the car at the stoplight over here and, you know, Sonny Meat and Cher and, you know, River Phoenix over there, it's, there's a lot to it, you know. For decades, the Strip was located in an unincorporated part of Los Angeles County, leaving it free from the watchful eyes of the LAPD. L.A. mob boss Mickey Cohen called this home, controlling the underworld from his Sunset Boulevard clothing store. The Strip became incorporated into the new city of West Hollywood in 1984. Since the beginning, the place has been defined by the people who come here. I love the movies ever since I was a baby. My mother not being able to speak English, she came from Italy with my dad, and she used to take us to the movies all the time to keep us comfortable in that respect. And more or less, I just got starstruck with everybody. Read the modern screen magazines, photo play, I was in just in, involved with just wanting to be and see the stars. Yeah, I came to California when I was 40 years old. I just want to slow down a little bit. And uh, my ex-partner, which is Elmer Valentine, he says, oh, they're robbing me blind. You've got to come down around this club. Because it's not, not about a club. You have those lines around a block, and they're robbing them blind. Well, anyway, I went down there, to make a long story short. Fired everybody in place, hired all new help, and uh, here I am, still here. We would go to Schwab's and have lunch and dinner, and you could sit and hobnob with all the celebrities. But that particular night, it was in April, is when the Academy Awards were gonna happen in two weeks. Right in the next booth was Cindy Portier and Diane Carroll. And I had told the wife, I said, you know, he might get the award tonight for the Lilies of the Field. She said, oh, he won't get it. I said, no, no, you're sitting next to the Academy Award winner right now. She wouldn't believe me. Those are the things I used to enjoy, and that's what I liked about this trip. When Sinatra would walk in, the whole town, the whole strip would come alive. You know, Sinatra's up there, Sinatra's up there. The press agent said, who's the broad with Sinatra? And Sinatra said to the lady, Excuse me, and he walked over and he put the guy in the phone booth and gave him one shot, you know, and the guy just crumpled. And he started to close the door and he opened the door and he said, the lady's name is Garland. <laughs> he closed the door. And any place in Hollywood is where new talent can be discovered. The vibrant Whisker go go on the celebrated Sunset Strip is his target for tonight. The birds, when we worked there, there was uh, 
still a couple of go-go dancers uh, in this great, I remember one girl had iridescent, she looked like a tropical fish. She had this wonderful green iridescent outfit on and boots and she was up there and literally above the stage so while you're playing you could look up at her. She was interesting. Janice Yaplin was never on the whiskey stage, but she sure sat in that booth and drank that Southern Comfort. I mean, she used to say, bring me by an F, and Southern Comfort, you know. She was a raunchy chick, stringy hair, dirty fingernails, but she was a beautiful lady. She was a hell of a girl, great entertainer. I loved her. One singer that was on the whiskey stage, Jim Morrison. The Doors got their start as the house band in 1966. The place I used to like when I come out here was Dino's. One New Year's Eve, Jane Mansfield was there with a great group of people there at Dino's. And in the course of the evening, naturally with the drinking, she started to get really loosey-goosey. And she finally wanted to sit on my lap and she was built in many ways. And finally my wife just turned around and said to her, if you don't get your fanny off my husband's lap, I'll dump you. And I said, my goodness, she got up fast and she ran away. She says, boy, they're not nice people. One night here, I was outside, and I come in as uh, this girl, big-breasted chick, uh, Annie Nicole Smith, Nicole LeBlanc. She got a very attractive face. She had that table in the front there, and she was exposed. There was four girls at her, right in that booth. I said, what the hell's going on here? You know, stop that. This is a restaurant. People dressed up, opening nights when that coal or uh, Sophie Tucker, one of these people that I'm sure nobody remembers today. But when they would open, people got dressed. They got in tuxedos and the women got very glamorous and so forth. So there was kind of a cafe society and it was quite glamorous. Billy Wilkerson, founder of The Hollywood Reporter, opened two of the strip's most famous night spots, the Trocadero in 1934 and Ciro's in 1940. Hollywood was Las Vegas before Las Vegas was Las Vegas, and Hollywood was wide open for gambling and prostitution. The Sunset Strip was just dotted with casinos and bordellos. I mean, it must have been an incredible place. The days of the super glamour stars seem to be gone. One thing that hasn't changed in Hollywood, though, is the constant invasion of young gals from all over the country coming to Hollywood to be discovered. But a fabulous body isn't enough. It also takes talent. New Year's Eve, there was a crowd. I mean, it was packed in here. Two girls, Oriental girls. They get in the middle of the floor and they start dancing. They're stripped naked right down to the bone. I didn't see it because I was outside. I said, what are you trying to do, get this place closed? But you know, stuff like that happens. People get loose, they get drunk, whatever, and it, it happens. And of course, at that point, Mothers Against Drunk Driving hadn't been active yet, and so it was much different. There was a lot of spirits that were flowing. Not as much drugs, there were not any drugs. A little bit of marijuana, but no, uh, not a lot of drugs. But boy, there was a lot of booze. I see so many people die from drugs, it's not even funny. But you try to preach to them, the kid Jim Morrison, I should shake that guy. What's wrong with you? He'd look up, he's stoned. Oh, Mario, I love you. That's all he used to say to me. But he was a good kid. But that drugs got to him. The guy OD'd, he went. This is one area that hasn't really changed much. Um, as long as Mario is still there up at the, at the whiskey, I'm happy. Because that's kind of like one of my favorite, that's like my favorite citizen of the Sunset Strip, kind of, you know, that, I, that I've ever known. So. I think, you know, it's just a place, it's like Broadway, you know, that, that kind of mentality of coming here to find fame and fortune, and it hasn't really changed.
Well, this was the golden land of opportunity. I mean, here it was California, and it was this wonderful place to be, and things were happening, and the weather was great, and people came out here. And a lot of the bands that did start out here, most of the members were from the Midwest and had come out here. Hence, for music, of course, to be in movies or something, or whatever, fast of entertainment, yeah, come to California. It's not going to happen in Wichita. According to Hollywood legend, Lana Turner was discovered sitting on a stool in Schwab's drugstore on the Sunset Strip. Well, the story is pure myth, but she did like to hang out on the Strip. Her favorite haunt was Ciro's, where for 30 years, music stars performed for movie stars. Let's face it, though, the legends that worked at Ciro's, there's some pretty good legends worked at the comedy store, too. You got Robin Williams and Jay Leno and David Letterman and all of those guys came out of that same room. It's a good room for performers, and it was then, too. Well, I first decided to come to the comedy store while sitting in the living room of my fraternity house, the ATO house at the University of Oklahoma in the spring of 74. We were all sitting around watching the Johnny Carson show, and this new comedian came out on the show named Freddie Prinze. Had a tremendous set, sat down and talked about this brand new place on the Sunset Strip. And as soon as I heard that, I knew I was in for warm winters and a nice place to work out. Originally, we, had, we all wore matching suits. Our manager wanted us to look like the Beatles. Ugly suits. We wore them one night here, the first night or something, awful. So we left them in the dressing room. And Little Richard's band came in on that period when we weren't here, and they took our suits. They must have thought they were great. And I said, hey, great. Everybody was happy. That was the last time we wore suits. The guitarist in Little Richard's band was a then unknown Jimi Hendrix. No matter the era, the strip remained a mecca for pleasure seekers and artists alike. I'm from East Los Angeles, or as white people call it, Latin Country Safari. <laughs> Comics wouldn't think of going home until the very end of the night, you know, because there was so much action and people were pairing off and you'd meet girls or you'd meet guys and, uh, you know, if you didn't have a half a gram of cocaine when you walked in the door, they gave you one. Pretty innocent, in a sense, then. There were no drugs predominantly displayed. There was none of that going on. That culture hadn't arrived yet. There was people coming to clubs and having a drink. And you would start going down Sunset, and it was just bumper to bumper traffic, and everybody was drinking beer and screaming out of their cars. and. There was the prostitutes and the drug dealers, and there was, as you got closer and closer into the strip, into right down into the, the uh, meat and potatoes of it, it got more and more electric. And on one end of the Sunset Strip was the rock and roll crowd, and we were sort of on the other end of the Sunset Strip. We were the stand-up comedy crowd, and we had just as much fun as they did. And, uh, I'll put our number of people at Betty Ford against their number of people at Betty Ford any time. It was a great time. Like I said, it was a really wonderful time. And then, I think what entered into it was the profit motive. About 1968, all of a sudden, hey, we can make money at this, and this, the music business got real big, and other things entered, negative things, drugs, heavy drug usage and stuff, and uh, that's what changed the whole area. The old Sunset Strip is dead. Long live the new strip. The wild antics of the royalty that once reigned here has become the way of life for the new rulers. The king is dead. Long live the new king. The new king in America rules, and the new king is the teenager. Will everybody please start moving out? 
So finally, people got to the dance supervisor and said, you gotta do something about this. So they finally cleaned it up and went away because it used to be a crazy looking fixture on Crystal Heights and Sunset, what they call Pandora's box. It had the craziest kind of pictures on it and figures on it that was really unbelievable that the people were afraid even to go out at night. Pandora's Box. It was the focal point of what became known as the Sunset Strip Riots. Police arrested hundreds of teenagers for violating curfew laws. When the man comes busting in. The cops' main job each night on the strip in the late 70s was whether or not they were going to clean up all the hookers off the street or not. Because this was a time back when there could have been three to 400 hookers between Doheny and Fairfax every single night. I look back on the 60s a little differently. A lot of things that everybody was trying to change, some got changed, some didn't get changed. Some, in some ways, were worse off than we were then. Other than the Vietnam War, which is a real nightmare, most of us were coming out of a post-World War II environment, very prosperous time in this country. We were all spoiled little brats. On March 5th, 1982, John Belushi was found dead from a heroin and cocaine overdose inside his $200 a night bungalow at the Chateau Marmont. From Belushi's death on, our lifestyle was no longer cute and funny. It was that great scene in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid where the sheriff says, your guys' this times is up. And our time was up that night onward. And, uh, so we all either you know, got well or died. From the night Richard Nixon resigned in 74 to 83, this town was more fun than was legal. Right after my first Tonight Show shot in 1980, I was offered 39 sitcoms uh, by Universal, Paramount, all the way down. Robin Williams jumped right off the stage of Westwood onto Mork and Mindy, and he was making $50,000, $60,000 a week back when that was a lot of money in 1978 and 79. And I don't know how many of us could have survived our, our habits with that much money in our pockets. So I, I thank God that, uh, that I didn't you know, jump into sitcoms when I could have and, and held out for a talk show, which is yet to come. <laughs> there was a whole lifestyle down there that I wanted to be part of. It's what I read about in Cream Magazine. It's what was going on in Rolling Stone magazine and I was a kid from Idaho so that's that's where I'm gonna go. A friend of mine kind of said that he was going to California and if if I wanted to go he needed someone to share gas money and I was so happy to get out of Tallahassee Florida at the time so I just came. Musicians rich and poor ate drank and networked at the Rainbow Bar and Grill. The name was inspired by a song over the rainbow from the Wizard of Oz. And you would think, how is some kid getting off a Greyhound bus from Idaho going to go to the rainbow and see? They're there. It's amazing. You, you go in and there's Robert Plant, and you, you know, you're bumping shoulders with Keith Richards. Like in the old days, like I would go to the rainbow, like when I was like 21, and I would get kicked out for dancing too wild in the upstairs. And I should have been in the rainbow anyway because it was still like, you know, groupies and, and long hair, like kind of rock stars from England. And then one night I actually got thrown out physically of the parking lot of the Rainbow for being too bad of a person.
that whole time seems like it, we weren't trying very hard. It was just it was who we were. We wrote music to rehearse. We rehearsed to play gigs. We played gigs to drink and get laid. And it was simple. I mean, we, we didn't even know what the billboard charts were, nor did we care. It's actually easier because you can sell your record through your website now and you know do all of your promotion through that and, and as long as people know that it's there they can catch up with you whenever they want and I think it also develops a, a closer sort of uh, person who likes your band and band relationship. I'm not a big fan of concept bands, and you see, you know, flyers of a band that obviously they got dressed, they got their makeup, they got their look, they picked each other because of the way they looked, they got their sound together, and they went down to the Sunset Trip and they wanted to get famous. You know, you start out playing on a Monday at midnight, and, you know, hopefully that turns into a series of Mondays at midnight, and if enough people stay to see your thing at midnight, they go, well, okay, we'll move you to Tuesday at midnight, you know. After you've got a week long of midnights going, you can then start at Monday at nine, and then you start the process over until like, you know, three or four years later, you get like, you know, ooh, weekend, you know. <laughs> In 1991, Milli Vanilli singer Rob Pilatus attempted suicide by slashing his wrist and threatening to jump from the ninth floor of the Mondrian Hotel. I'm shocked that I'm even alive because that, that was like hard living down there. It was serious hard living. And the fact that none of us were shot, knifed, maimed one way or another, deadly diseases transferred around. I mean, everybody was fucking everybody. And it was okay. Actually, John Doe and I wrote a song called The Unheard Music that's about standing in front of the whiskey um, and not being allowed in. Like, you know, 30 or 40 people just standing out in front of the whiskey smoking cigarettes and kind of sur surreptitiously drinking and watching the cars go by. And um, somebody walked across the street, there was a big dumpster and it was full of vinyl and cardboard. So somebody got the idea that if you, you know, that would burn well. And so they got it up to the strip and set it on fire and pushed it down sunset. So there was this flaming dumpster going down sunset. When Led Zeppelin played the strip, they liked to stay at the Hyatt House, which was nicknamed the Riot House. They rode motorcycles down the hallways and threw hotel furniture from 12th floor windows. You know, that, that was like real selfish. You know, you'd do a bunch of drugs, do, do anything you wanted to do, and at the end of the day, you had no remorse. And I think that's why there was a real backlash against the 80s and the 90s. It's like, well, how can you have no remorse? We need to save a tree, save a whale. We were like, fuck the whales, fuck the trees. There's not gonna be anything. We had more of a punk rock attitude. There's not gonna be anything here tomorrow. There was a lot of resistance to the punk thing, and I think because the, the, the people that were still like playing, playing the older music on the radio, like Led Zeppelin and The Doors, were more into the Van Halen, Gazzari type bands, and so there were more heavy metal, um, glam, and rock, regular rock bands on the strip, and the punk thing was not happening on the strip. There were, you couldn't play. Rock and roll was becoming more of the norm, and punk was sort of phasing out, but there was that Clash of the Titans moment there. There's like these really young kids with their mohawks, but they didn't really know what the pistols were about, and they were too young to be around for the, the dolls or the Ramones, so they were kind of faking it, and we weren't faking it, so we were like rabid dogs. We would get drunk at our apartment, go down to the whiskey, all decked out, like just to piss these guys off and get in fist fights and just knock the shit out of them because we were like real, really from the street and these guys were like coming from their mom's house in Covina or something, you know, with, with little 16 year olds or fake IDs and having their first two beers. And so we would actually go down there and hunt. That's why the punk thing kind of stood apart, and the hippie thing too. There was a focus of doing it to do it, 
doing it to make a difference, doing it to be an artist, doing it to enjoy life, doing it to be outside of society. You don't have to be, you don't have to fit into society. You can play music for a living. You can live with your friends and you can get by and it's a great life. As I got older and I grew up and I had kids and, and other responsibilities, that the innocence of just, you know, waking up, having a beer, doing a line of cocaine, riding on your Harley down Sunset Boulevard and going to a strip club, it doesn't really work. And you do see some of these people down there still doing it, and it's kind of sad, you know? There is this feeling that it's entirely possible that you can be discovered here, because if you're making a lot of noise on Sunset, the feeling is more people will respond, more people will hear about it, where if you're playing a club in the Valley, people will be like, hey, that's great. Congratulations. Hey, you're making money on the Valley. That's great, you know. Hey, we're playing a midnight at the Roxy, and, uh, you know, it's going to cost us $1,500. Really? Well, we're going. It was always an, an interesting thoroughfare. It's always been since the days when, you know, the agents first set up shop here, when it was sort of between Beverly Hills and, and, and Burbank, the studios. I think it's always been a, uh, a location where the film and music communities pass through. Sunset Strip billboards were originally used to attract the attention of managers and agents as they drove from their homes in Beverly Hills to their offices in Hollywood. These larger-than-life ads became known as vanity boards. People come here uh, not only for the weather, but also to be discovered, knowing that there's only 10 out of 100 that succeed. Where do the other 90% go? They, well, they look for jobs as busboys and waiters, waitresses, bartenders, and trying to be discovered that way. Well, I used to be a musician. I used to play a lot at the clubs, the whiskey, at the Viper Room, and I like the energy up here. A lot of rock and roll, a lot of um, people coming in um, from all over to check out the Sunset Strip. So I've spent a lot of time in this area, and I live right down the street, and I love this area. Um, so why not work in this area? It's perfect. I graduated SC Film and tried to do the directing thing for a while. And um, it worked out and it didn't work out, but eventually decided to take a break and get into the, the restaurant bar business. Um, I moved here from Texas. I came here, honestly, to be a performer. And I'm studying right now to be a performer. And I, I work in the industry, so I make sure that my life is all about performing. In my hometown, there's like a thousand people. And I say out here, outside, inside, we probably had about that many in the store just for like one night, so. And then especially like where I live, there's more people that live in my apartment complex than in my hometown. My town's dry and, you know, it's just a little, little tiny Kentucky town, so. It's kind of like, you know, a little bit of culture shock when I came out here, but you get used to it. I think sometimes L.A. gets nailed for not really having a culture, and I think the reason is is because it's a transient city. Uh, people come here to seek their fortune, and whether they do or not, once they hit, hit the big time or don't hit the big time, they move leaving room for the next influx of people to do the same thing. So if there is a culture, it's based on this idea that you come here for a very specific purpose. We do get tourists just because of our Hollywood history. Um, the Trocadero was originally founded back in 1934, and we're kind of an homage to the old Trocadero, trying to bring back a little bit of the old Hollywood class to the new Sunset Strip. It was a restaurant era, you know, even before we were here. You had uh, the Mocambo, you had Ciro's, you had uh, La Rue, 
which was across the street. But that was the end of that era. When we came here, we started a new era with the people in the music business and a new decor, uh, art deco, decor. And we had as backers in this restaurant with uh, money, uh, people like Elton John and Rod Stewart, Olivia Newton-John, and so on. You'll have like somebody come in who's like, you know, extremely famous and you want to kind of just make sure nobody's coming up and bothering from autographs and stuff like that because I mean, if you're a celebrity, you don't want to be getting hounded for autographs while you're buying a vibrator or something like that, so. We were sitting here one night after hours at one o'clock in the company of Elton John and his band. The kitchen was closed, first of all. The kitchen was closed and we are the owners of the place, but we didn't have the keys of the refrigerator. The chef took that along. But we had access to one refrigerator behind the bar here where we kept the caviar. We went to the kitchen and we saw some boxes of uh, dry spaghetti. So we made a sauce out of the vodka, put in some chives, onions, and cream, reduced that, put the spaghetti in there, then rolled the spaghetti up in the, in the form of a cigar, and then each got a soup spoon of caviar on top of the spaghetti, and that's how this dish was created. Out of nothing came a very famous dish, and we sell a lot of that today. great is, is uh, Lawrence Fishburne. He'll come in at like 1.30 in the morning and he'll sit and chat with us, the people that work here, and I think that's really cool when celebrities can do that, when they can just hang with the, with the crew and people that are just, you know, there to help him and serve him, and that's, he's a cool guy. one I ever had was, uh, uh, I guess a woman was trying to talk her husband into uh, buying a strap on that she could use on him. And he came, in, he came up pleading with me. It was like, you know, she was wanting to buy something huge and he was just like, you gotta talk her down. <laughs> and, I mean, he was, he was just like sweating. And she was just like, you know, just leading him around saying, I want this, this, and this. And he was just like, you gotta help me. in the industry um, are also in art of some sort, either music or acting or writing, and I do all of that and love it. And, um, and it gives you a lot of freedom to be able to have your days off to do that and then come to work at a great fun spot at night and, and, and take in this whole experience, so yeah. You know, I see we have a, a, about 60 feet of frontage on Sunset Boulevard with our open air patio where people eat and dine and drink and smoke and everything. And I, sometimes I think like we should charge admission prices to watch the circus. I mean, it's nuts. They say, I think West Hollywood jumps from something like 30,000 residents to 250,000 people on a Friday and Saturday night. There's all walks of life, all types of people. Anywhere from high class to low class to who are you gonna be class or where do I wanna be class? Because there's no distinction on the Sunset Strip. You are who you are, you portray who you wanna be, or you are who you are and you see what comes to be. There's so many different sections to it. There's the celebrity crowd, there's the wannabe crowd, there's the kids of the celebrity crowd, there's the, the people that just go out to have a good time, hang out with their friends, there's the business crowd, there's the tourist crowd. I mean, it's like, and when we all blend, the thing about this place that's great is we all blend together here.
So, yeah, I'd like to open another spot eventually. Um, starting to focus on my directing career again, getting back into that, which hopefully, you know, I've met a lot of interesting people here. A lot of producers, actors, directors come through our doors. But who knows, you know, you take, you know, sunset, you're only as good as your last night. In 1992, the 160,000-square-foot Virgin Megastore complex was erected on the corner of Sunset and Crescent Heights, the former site of Schwab's drugstore. There was an element of, of raciness and scandal about it that people associated with it that was really appealing and attractive. Of course, that hardly exists today. Uh, there have been many complaints that the Sunset Strip has been Disneyfied to a certain degree. It used to be a lot of cigarettes and tobacco. Now it's, you know, more regular products, a lot of clothing, and a lot of, there's always been movies and records. Now there's gonna be a lot of clothing and cars. The Marlboro Man was up there for 27 years. And then because of the smoking ban, well, they felt this had to come down. And the majority of the council decided, well, we'll have to take it away and put something else there and tell the billboard people to change it entirely. The Strip's most recent development, the four-acre Sunset Millennium Project, with a planned luxury hotel, three office towers, and 200,000 square feet of retail space intended for high-end shops and restaurants. I think there's something for everyone, and I think that's the trend right now. You know, cater to everyone, bring the masses together, have everyone, you know, party cohesively without problems. Uh, we get all sizes and shapes and uh, different crowds, but we just have to make sure that, uh, again, my number one concern is for uh, knuckleheads and troublemakers to come in, bring weapons, and we make sure that, that no one can come in wearing baggy pants, baggy jeans, or anything suspicious looking, so we enforce dress code. I sort of liked the grittiness uh, that used to be here uh, before as well. I mean, I think it's, it's been very gentrified, which has, you know, all the attendant pros and cons. I mean, I think the sort of traffic now on weekends is, is really quite difficult to navigate. It took us about 38 minutes to go about a little over a mile. The last time I hear actually, some guy shot about like 25 rounds. Are you serious? I swear to God. 25 rounds, but no one got hit. But we were like 10 feet away from him. And then we started running. Are you serious? Oh my That's gosh. like twice since that. People come up here, they want to have a good time. They have a few drinks. They get a little loud. They play their stereos in their cars. And then they drive south into our residential areas. So trying to protect the residential community from that impact. And we've been working on that. The businesses have been very helpful in trying to contain the, the excitement up here and not have it impact our residents. Because it was getting so that even our neighbors in Los Angeles were complaining about what these kids were doing. They would come here, couldn't go into some of the venues that they had. They would buy something in a liquor store drink it up and then have all kinds of acts on these people's lawns. And then we said, well, we'll stop the cruise and get only the people who can do that. Like when I started 20 something years ago, everybody was drunk, you know what I mean? But like uh, now very seldom, like only on a Saturday night between like two and three will we see drunk people, you know?
Just the amount of nightclubs and the alcohol consumption up here. Due to the fact that we have such, the speed is so low, we don't get a lot of accidents pertaining to the drug drivers because of the, uh, the traffic and the fact that uh, they don't really have a chance to get away. The pervasive law enforcement presence on the Strip has decreased crime and stemmed the once rampant tide of prostitutes working the boulevard. They have a baby to support, they got bills, they got deputy father, deputy boyfriends, so they have to pay the bills. So this is the place to make their money and be safe. It's better than here than on the street. Have some pimp somebody helps you out of there. There's like the punk people walking down the street and the hair people walking down the street. Hair bands and punk bands and tourists. And that's exactly the same way it was then, except I think the difference was back then those were the, the actual real hair bands and, and real punks. And so it's kind of got a you know universal city walk kind of thing to it that's a little odd. And I think people don't realize the best places to go see stars are like, you know, AA meetings and supermarkets and, you know, and not buying a map of the stars' homes, you know. Oh, well, like a lot of people, they come in, they'll shop with their, you know, their shirts and go back in lingerie, and then they won't even know we have a video section or a toy section. You have a toy section? They're like, yeah, or then we'll just point them down the cafe, go down and get a bagel or a coffee. And something that they sell now. You know, Sunset Strip, I think, is a, it's an idea. It's a concept, you know? Um, I mean, there's some really great stuff here, but I mean, it definitely is sold worldwide as, you know, this, you know, sunset, you know. In 1939, author Nathaniel West described the people who come here. Maybe they weren't really desperate enough to set a single city on fire, let alone the whole country. Maybe they were only the pick of America's madmen, and not at all typical of the rest of the land.